Welcome to T21 Mom. Hi friends, it's Mary and welcome to the T21 Mom podcast and this is episode 104. Now, have you ever thought about maybe pulling your child from public school or possibly private school or maybe you're just at the start of your schooling journey and maybe you want to think about homeschooling. If you're curious about homeschooling, interested or want to know more, you'll definitely want to listen to today's episode. I am chatting with my good friend and fellow rock and mom, Christine Weeb. We first met at the retreat in Phoenix. I can't remember what year that was, 2017, I think. And she's a fellow Canadian as well. And we bonded over our love of cookies because that is how we managed to get to the retreat. But she's also a homeschooling mama. And she has homeschooled her four kids, including her third child, McKenna, who has Down syndrome. So let's go take a listen. Today on the T21 Mom podcast, we have a returning guest, my good friend, Christine Weep. Welcome, Christine. Thanks for having me back again. Oh, you're more than- Looking forward to our conversation today. Yes, me too. And I'm glad that you brought it up to me again. (laughs) (laughs) Christine and I, we first met as roommates at our very first retreat in Phoenix. It seems so long ago now with everything that's happened between then and now. And we also bonded over our love of cookies because that's how we fundraised our way to the retreat. Now, Christine is a homeschooling mama. And I first had her on when the whole world was shutting down and we were all thrown into homeschooling or rather Uh, crisis schooling, because that's really what it was. But thankfully, most things have returned back to normal. So today we're going to talk about actual homeschooling for our kiddos. Now, people choose to homeschool their kids for various reasons. And you, Christine, you have typical typical kids and McKenna, who has Down syndrome. But what are some of the main reasons to homeschool our kids? Well, you'd be surprised. There's actually quite a list. I had my own personal reasons, but, and rather than just only sharing those, I did pull some of the homeschoolers I know through online groups just to see what all of their reasons would be as well. So I can rattle through those if you're interested. <laughs> Let's have us take a stab oh. at them. So yeah, share all away. All right. I kind of found that they fell into about eight different categories. So uh, one of them was it's family related. They they already had other siblings that were being homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Uh, They wanted more sibling bonding and just in general, more family time. Public school does take a lot of time out of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time kids are home and fed and bathed, it's bedtime already. So for some people, it's family related. Mm -hmm. Education related. Um, Kids that are homeschooled receive one-on-one instruction. Parents can adapt to their child's strength, their needs and their learning styles. They can adapt to their kids' interests. They can slow things down or speed them up so that they can work at their kid's own pace. And some of them also reported that their reason that was related to education was that they were getting very, very poor results in their children's learning at public school. So that's the education-related reason. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some people choose it simply for the convenience because it works best with their parents' schedules and travel. They can flexibly schedule their children's day to work for them. They can homeschool around therapies or just the general schedule of the family. Mm -hmm. So there are a few people for whom that was their main reason. Some people do it for social related ones because, well, let's admit it. If anybody has talked to anybody related to homeschooling, almost always you'll have a question of socialization. Mm -hmm. And some parents don't like the socialization that their child is receiving at public school, that bad things that they're picking up from the kids and not having control over what kind of peer models they have. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for some kids, that's or, or that's why their parents put them in public school. But for some, that's why they pull them out. So that was that whole question of social. There are reasons that are regarding either a positive or poor learning invite in environment. The ones related to a 
positive learning environment is that they can adapt the environments to meet their kids' needs. They can learn at times that work best for the child. They can spend more time outside and active. They can learn their science and other subjects out in nature or in natural life environments. So, um, sorry, and I know how you said you can sort of pick the time that you want to school, I guess, your kids, because I know you have said that you your family does better in the afternoons as a like yep. opposed to, you know, typical public school starts generally 830 or nine. But you guys yep. tend to start later in the day, correct? Yes. Yes. And I've had two teenagers that I was homeschooling for the last number of years. And I know that there's been studies done and, and it shows that teenagers really don't do so good learning in the earlier morning hours. And we have the flexibility that we've been able to adapt. We chose the afternoon because when their two little sisters came along, that was their nap time. And so it was just a much more ideal environment to homeschool when it worked for us rather than when others said we should do it. Right. Yes, that makes total sense. I hadn't until you had told me that I never had really thought about that, that, yeah, it doesn't have to be like a nine to three. And I have heard from other homeschool parents that you don't need an, like a six hour day. You can generally do what needs to be done in a, just a couple of hours. Yeah. And even with that, you can you can slice and dice it if needed. I know some people in the homeschooling community that have kids with Down syndrome and they'll do like 10 minutes. And if their child attention isn't there, they'll be like, okay, that's fine. We'll just do something else for a while. And then they'll revisit some more school in an hour or a few hours or whatever is working for them. Mm -hmm. And there's really that freedom to do that. Yeah, which is is really awesome, I think. Yeah, yeah. Positive learning environment. There, You have the best environment to work on life skills when you're at home. Or should I say life schooling? Because your child isn't just learning at home. You go to the grocery shore, store. They can be learning life skills there. Like there's so many, so much more. It's called homeschooling, but that's not the only place that homeschoolers learn. That's um, true. Again, I hadn't thought of that either. So yes. <laughs> and families are also are the best cheerleaders for their own children, mm -hmm. which is another reason why some people homeschool because they're there and they can keep things positive and they can encourage their, their children in a way that maybe others can't. So that was the positive learning environment related ones. You probably already guessed that about some of the poor learning environment related ones, things like Kids may have been bullied in mm -hmm. public school. It's a very distracting environment for many kids. Or, you know, if, if your kid has sensory issues, it's a very overstimulating environment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes children's physical safety and mental health isn't taken as seriously as it needs to be. And go figure, sometimes staff doesn't follow IEP or work with the parents to create them. So those were some reasons that were given why people chose to homeschool based off of like it not being a great environment for their kids at public school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I have read in various online groups, many of the things that you've talked about why parents have chosen to homeschool. Their kids were in public school or private school. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that you said were occurring and they felt it would be better to homeschool, you know, to homeschool their child. Now, if you're homeschooling your child with Down syndrome, normally in the public school, we would have an IEP. So when a child with Down syndrome or other special needs is being homeschooled, do they still have an IEP? <laughs> this is where I insert a joke. I, I always like to tell people that every kid that's homeschooled has an IEP because it stands for Individualized Education Plan. So you're going to plan something for your ch kid and it's going to be individualized to them anyway. So yes, they have an IEP in that sense, but in general, that whether there's an IEP, that'll depend on where you live and what regulations there are mm -hmm. and whether you need to follow a set of regulations in order to get access to the supports that would be there. It's going to be different for everyone in my province. You don't need to worry about IEPs. We submit notification and fall and a report in January and in June. And that's all that we have to do regulation-wise. On the okay. other hand, we also don't have support, really, that we have access to. 
I know with my daughter, I can access speech therapy only four times a year and really can't access any other therapies. At this point, we have a homeschool organization that is petitioning the government to try and get better access for some of those things because they're really needs of all children, regardless of where they're schooled. But uh, in online groups, I've also seen a wide variety of things in the U.S. as far as what they have access to do to whether or not they're requiring an IEP to access those things and so on. Interesting. So, like, I know you said it depends on where you live, obviously. But, yeah. And and you said that you submit reports and so on. But does the school district, I don't know if that's the right term, but do they see or okay the IEP, in particular, if your child has Down syndrome? Do they care? That's a really care? good question. It's one I can't quite answer just because I... I'm not in a place where any of that is required, but if people are wondering that are listening to the podcast, it's, it would be a, something where you might want to join a online homeschooling group and just see what people in your area have been able to access. What are the requirements? Do they need an IEP? All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's kind of interesting. This, I, I mean, totally a little bit unrelated. I just, our, someone had told me about a mom, their child didn't have Down syndrome, but she obviously had some personal challenges herself that she was keeping her son home, you know, quote unquote, homeschooling him, but really wasn't. And, you know, it was really at the detriment to the child. And, you know, and then other things had to come into play and, and so on. So that's why I was curious they need an IEP in place because, but like you said, it really just depends on where you live. So you sometimes could worry that kids could fall through the cracks if the parents aren't serious about what they're doing. Cause I do think, you know, this is a huge role like that you have to take on and be willing to take on. I know that it's, that's not my gig. <laughs> I know I'm not cut out for that. So uh, that's interesting. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but can anyone do this? Can anyone homeschool? Do you need any kind of special training or do you need a degree or how does it work? I'm just going to give a conditional yes. Anybody can homeschool if they have the right reasons and motivations. Even you could if it was going to be the right decision for you, if mm -hmm. you, you had the right reasons to do it. Absolutely. Anybody can homeschool. I just want to share that, that there is a place called the National Home Education Research Institute, and they do all sorts of research on things like homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And I heard it in the past. And before talking to you today, I went back and revisited it because I knew that there had been studies done that showed that there is no statistical differences in how children do on scores on tests based solely on their parents' ed level of education. So it, not even the level of education will make your children do better or worse with, as a homeschooler. So you don't need a degree. All you need is the passion and desire to do it. Awesome. I think, you know, that's kind of reassuring for a lot of parents that they, you know, they don't need any kind of special training. Like you said, just the motivation, I think the desire and the passion and the want to do it. Because I don't, I don't think it's easy, which is one of the reasons why I, I just don't think I could do it. So <laughs> I've been a little nervous um, considering homeschooling McKenna when she was younger and even over the years as I've started. Mm -hmm. But uh, what really encouraged me last year is I was at a homeschool con conference and one of our um, Department of Education liaisons mm -hmm. happened to be there. We were having a conversation because he attended the session that I was on a special needs panel for. And we were talking about, you know, kids with special needs and such. And he said to me, Christine, you're doing the absolutely right thing for your child. Your child will learn way more being homeschooled than they ever would in the public school system. And this is somebody who worked in the public school system for a very, very long time, reassuring me that I was doing the right thing. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So... I, like, do you still have to follow like a curriculum 
or goals that are set out by the school district you're in? Like, do you have to have, like, for example, I, I'm thinking each grade ha has certain expectations that should be met. So how does it work when you have a child with Down syndrome? <laughs> well, before you even hop into the part about, about Down syndrome, when it comes to curriculum, schools, public schools, even homeschool curriculums, they have what's called a scope and sequence. Mm -hmm. And it's just an organized way at lo of looking at things that are supposed to ensure that your, your education won't have any holes. Uh, okay. Public schools are not. It, holes happen. It's just how, how things go. But even the scope and sequence has just been laid out by somebody saying, this is how I think things should be covered. I think astronomy should be covered in grade one, or I say, you know, biology or physics or whatever should be covered in a certain grade. It's not like if you don't do it at whatever grade they say in a so scope and sequence that you've messed it up or your kid can't learn. Now with English and math, there is a building of skills. Mm -hmm. And so they've divided it up into the 12 years of education. Um, but you can go slower or faster, even with homeschooling. I don't know of any specific states or provinces where they say you must learn exactly these things at this time. Mm -hmm. But this is the point in our discussion where I'm going to bring up LBA, which stands for Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Mm -hmm. You can find both an American and a Canadian website. Yeah. They have links to your local state or province, what their regulations are to the, to the websites where you learn more about it. They have some of that information actually on their website and it helps guide you so you so you know what specifically is needed for your area. Now, related to what you need to cover or not cover with curriculum, in the province of Manitoba, where I'm from, you have to have on your plan when you notify that what you're going to do to cover math, language arts, science, and social studies. And so okay. as long as you're teaching those four main groups, it looks like you're not just going to sit on your behind, watch soap operas and do nothing. As long as they can see you that you actually have a plan, there is no issue with saying this is what we're going to cover this year. So do you have to sort of submit like a plan for the, at the beginning yes. of each school year? The regulations in Manitoba are that I need to su submit a plan. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was living in Ontario... The only thing I would have to do would be notify the province or school division. I'm not sure which one it is that I'm homeschooling and I wouldn't even be needing to do more than that. So it really varies from province wow. to province and state to state what is required, which is why I pointed pointed out HSLBA. Wow, that's incredible. I would have thought Ontario being such a large and populous province that they would have more stringent rules. You know, it sounds like they're a little bit more laid back about it all. So I guess in some ways that's good. Maybe in others, not so good. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So, no, yes, they say you have to learn like science, language, arts, math, et cetera. But can you determine what your child is taught? Like, for example, maybe they're really excellent readers, as our kids often are, because they're very visual learners. Or, like, can you put a stronger emphasis on that as opposed to maybe math? That's a very good question. Again, some of that might vary from place to place, but there have been years where we focused more on one area than another. We haven't done it where we've dropped something, but but yes, there's been years, or or even like if your child is struggling more so in an area and you just really need to re revisit things, or spend a lot more time on it, then there's been years where I've been lighter on another year. Okay, good to know. So you've decided you want to homeschool and you're to homeschool your child with Down syndrome. You probably have, often will have other typical kids as well. Where do you learn how to teach our kids various subjects, such as reading and math? Like, because I think that would be overwhelming. I, I would, like for me, it would be overwhelming. <laughs> Well, the first thing you need to do is pat yourself on the back because even before they get to math and English and some of those other subjects, you've been teaching them. From the moment your child was born, you've been teaching them. And just realizing and understanding that, like, 
if you're with a typical developing child, if they learned their ABC song from mom and dad, they learned their ABC song from mom and dad. Mom and dad taught them that. Um, most of us are involved in teaching our children to walk or body training them or anything. So there are things that we've done. Um, sometimes you have to use outside resources to help you with that. And that's the case as well with, with teaching children in a homeschool kind of a setting. But but all of us have done some degree of teaching with our kids. And that is helpful to know in moving forward because we also know what's worked and what has worked in those ways. Mm. There's lots of places or ways that you can learn more about like how to teach or how to teach well. My favorite one when I connect with a new homeschooler is actually more of a mentorship type thing where I sit mm -hmm. down and we, we have a conversation. We look at their kids' strengths and weaknesses. We look at mom's strengths and weaknesses. We look at what what would excite them for a homeschool situation. And then I try and give some recommendations of things that might help them curriculum-wise. Almost all curriculums either are set up in a way where uh, a parent doesn't necessarily have to have a specific plan and this is exactly how you teach them this and then there are other ones where you get a, a parent's guide or a parent's manual and it will tell you on this day pull out these three items mm -hmm. you do this with your student and then get them to complete so you can find things where there's a lot more hand holding and you can find things where there's a lot less hand holding and i think that's one of the great things about homeschool as well so yeah i've mentioned men mentorship there's online groups that you can seek out where you can ask questions, hear how other people do things. You can even find people's how-to videos on YouTube about what they do in their homeschool. Mm -hmm. All sorts of places like that. There's online resources. And uh, I know you mentioned specific subjects. A while back, I was made aware that the DRSF, which I know you've talked about on your show before, that they have some some degree of resources online mm -hmm. as well that are meant to help you know best how to teach those subjects matter to your children. There's even books. There's a book by Patricia Olwine that how to teach your child with Down syndrome how to read. And it goes through how to use the strengths of the general Down syndrome population to help teach your child to read. Fantastic. So there, well, there are a number of resources. Okay. We'll have to send me the link so then I can put that in the show notes because I'm sure parents would be interested in that. I know I'm interested in that. Ainsley does do some reading through the DSRF. It's been a little bit of hit yeah. and miss this year because of my schedule. So, but I want to get back into it because I know she can read, but just reading with fluency, like to read a book or, or what have you. So, because I think it will also yeah. help a lot with her, just her regular day-to-day -day communication. So, you know, I'm... Mm -hmm. Because I really feel that speech, reading is their gateway in life. If they can somehow communicate, sometimes it's not always through actual speech, but communicate and read, I think, you know, it'll be just so much easier for them if they have those skills. Like once they're beyond school, you know, going into the workforce or just whatever they decide to do once school is over. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sure it varies where you live, like even just the reporting and so on is different from what you said. But for example, Ainsley in particular, she has a dual diagnosis. She gets a significant amount of funding allotted to her, but it doesn't actually go directly to the school. It actually goes to the school district and then they determine how it's distributed. You know, I'm, I have some opinions about that. I understand the reason behind that, but also, that's my kids' funding. So how does it work when you homeschool? Do you get any kind of funding for homeschooling, in particular for McKenna? In our personal situation, no. And that's partly just due to the province we live in. The province we live in, we, we have what I would say is not very intrusive regulations for homeschooling. It's very simple. It's the it's the notification and the two reports and the lobbying groups in our province for homeschooling, specifically when they were doing the lawmaking regarding home education, did not want to, to try and have any kind of funding for homeschooling. 
but they did that with a very good intent. And that was so that we'd have a lot more freedom as to how we homeschool, what methods we use and things like that. Because in general, if the government's going to give money, they're going to have a lot of red tape with it. It mm-hmm. will be like you need to do A, B, C and whatever. And, and in this province, if I want to try and educate my child using more of a life schooling, unschooling method where it's not, here's not a, there's not a workbook to show. I have more freedom to do that because I don't have somebody saying, well, it has to look this way. I know in Alberta and in BC, there is funding just in general, not necessarily uh, related to special needs, but you can get generalized funding for your homeschool. But as I said, there's more red tape. You have to, I think in BC, you need to sit down with a, a university educated teacher And they have to look over your plans and you have to check in with them on a very Mm -hmm. regular basis. So there's some pluses and minuses to Mm -hmm. it. But uh, where we live, we don't get any kind of funding. So you don't get any assistance, like especially for your older kids in buying textbooks or anything? Nope. We, We don't get any assistance, but we can pretty much use any materials that we really want. You know, provided it looks like we're giving an, an equivalent education. It doesn't have to be equal as in looking like a public schooler's education, but it needs to be like we're not uh, giving them no education. They need to be able to feel like when they're 18, they'll also go out and be able to be successful. So, right. Very interesting. Because I know you mentioned that McKenna really only gets access to speech therapy four times a year, which is absolutely ludicrous. You know, yes. Ainsley. I think she was getting it a half hour once a week, I think, at school. I don't really care so much what she's getting at school because we go weekly to the DSRF anyways, which I think is probably more valuable for her. Uh, But if they're going to give her that half an hour a week, I'm all for it. But that's terrible that your, your kids, just because you choose to homeschool, really don't have access to those other therapies. Do you know if it's similar to that, like that in other provinces? I have not asked those questions elsewhere, but in some of the working I've done in homeschooling and Down syndrome groups, uh, I do know that it's, it's going to be different depending on where you live. Interesting. Now, you mentioned something that I think we might have talked about it in the first, the first time you're here. I've heard of it. You mentioned unschooling. What is that? Yes. It's really a interest-based kind of learning. It's going with the flow of where your child's at and what they're interested in and what they're doing. Because really, almost anything in life, once you're an adult, unless you're specifically getting an education for a specific career, everything you do as an adult is pretty much unschooling. You you're the one that decides you want to learn how to drive a car. And so you look for, well, how, where do I go to learn how to drive a car? Or you want to learn how to cook something. You find YouTube videos and whatever. You, you, there are resources. And, and with unschooling, parents are more like the resource coordinator mm-hmm. where the child is doing more of the driving. And at one point with my son, we had a little bit more of an unschool approach to his language arts. And so some of what he was doing for his writing was he wanted to write uh, a bit of a blog about Mm -hmm. video games. Mm -hmm. So you have to have grammar there and whatever. And he cared about how people would look at him and view him. So he was wanting to learn and interested in making sure that he communicated effectively and that he sounded like he knew what he was talking about. So that's kind of a little bit of a sampling of what unschooling might look Like it might look a little different for a child with Down syndrome, but even in that case, like, like I said, life school, like if you're at the grocery store, you're going to have math, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, how many avocados are we picking up today or how much money does mom need to give to the cashier or things like that. So just in general, unschooling is basically schooling through life. I kind of thought that's what it was, but. I wasn't entirely sure. I kind of hear it when in the homeschooling kind of groups. I mean, I'm not in those groups, but that's sort of where I kind of hear it, you know, from other parents who are are homeschooling. So 
yeah, I, I thought it was sort of just a slightly different approach to, to homeschooling or just another way of homeschooling. So very interesting. Yes. Now, you talked about this in the beginning, but a lot of people who obviously who don't homeschool, but they feel with homeschooling that their child would miss out on socialization and social interactions, in particular with their child with Down syndrome. However, you know, from what I have seen just from my younger brother, whose wife homeschooled their kids for a number of years, uh, and from talking to others, that this seems to be more of a myth. I mean, my brother's kids were busy in everything with the homeschool community. Can you comment or share your thoughts on this? Because I think for a lot of people, this is the number one thing that I hear a lot about is that they're going to miss out on that socialization. They're not going to have that interaction. But I don't think that's really the case. But I'll, I also, but my brother's kids are typical. So how does that work for a child with Down syndrome? Well, I kind of feel that when it comes to socialization and the social aspect, it's either there as much or as little as the parents make it be. It's not, be, it's not that if a child with or without Down syndrome is homeschooled, that they won't be socialized. A lot of socialization in life in general until your kid goes to public school is just learning how to live in society with various people, various ages. Your, your child learns how to say hi to grandma and grandpa, and how to be polite and all those things. That's socialization. And that's one of people's worries is, you know, will homeschool kids know how to get along in real life? And that I, there's a lot of research out there that shows this whole lack of socialization stuff is a myth. The difference is whether your child is socialized by 30 kids in their classroom and their teacher or whether it's in other situations. Mm -hmm. So in relation to the more social aspect, I think, you know, even for public school kids, a wow. lot of them, their parents have them in dance class or they go to church in Sunday school or their family likes to go out to the park on the weekend or there's there's so many opportunities, some that are more thoughtful and intentional and scheduled and some that are less. And homeschoolers don't need to miss out on those either. Like mm -hmm. homeschoolers, oftentimes, if you're around a place where there's many other homeschoolers, there might be a homeschoolers event where people will all go to the museum together or they'll plan a park day or a soccer league or whatever. So there generally isn't a lack of being able to get out and be social unless you're more uh, geographically isolated, then it can be more of an issue. Of course, of course. So as I mentioned, I know that I'm not really cut out to homeschool. The whole pandemic proved that, <laughs> although that was a whole different ball game there. But I just, I don't think I have the patience for it, to be honest. I don't either. <laughs> but you're doing I'm it. I'm here for models. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. I'm not patient, but I'm having lots of opportunity to flex those muscles. That's great. That's pretty awesome. You know, but I can understand why people do it. And if you're thinking about it, we're... There's one start. Like if someone came up to you and said, you know, I've been thinking of homeschooling, where do I start? What do I do? What would you tell them? Well, I, I would start off by saying it's very helpful to know what the regulations are surrounding your own province, state, or even country. I know there's some countries in the world where it is actually not legal to homeschool. Interesting. I believe Germany is one of them. Uh, you're, not, you're not able to homeschool in certain places. That, as far as I know, that does that's not true of any place in North America. So I would refer people to check the HSLBA websites, mm -hmm. and you can find out the regulations local to you. While you're doing that, then I would connect with others, either online or in person, because they do do a couple of really helpful things. One of them is they provide encouragement because they've also started at some point. Mm -hmm. They can reassure you that you can do this. They can tell you what worked for them, what didn't. They can give you some recommendations on curriculum. They're just useful in so, so many ways. And I think it's really helpful to find some place of me mentorship. Mm -hmm. And 
you know what, as far as where does one start, some places you can actually start any time as well. It's not just about start starting at the beginning of a school year. I've known people who pulled their kids at whatever point, provided the regulations with them and started homeschooling just because they felt it was the right thing at that mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen that many times for people, for whatever reason, like bullying or just not a good fit with the school or the classroom that they pulled their kid out midway through the year and they start to homeschool. So does it really matter if your child is just starting school or they are older and have already been in the public school system? In your opinion, do you think it really matters if you decide to homeschool? I don't think it matters. Uh, I know with typical kids, because they may have gotten associations with what school is supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like, they will take a period of time that they call de-schooling to just create a different relationship with school with mom, but one that isn't, oh, mom is pretending to be my teacher at public school. Right. Uh, they, they need to start seeing mom as facilitating their education, but not as trying to, you know, take that other role that they've never experienced her being and really don't want her to be. <laughs> so it, that would be one of the differences between homeschooling from the start and homeschooling later. But really, parents generally have the best grasp of what their kids uh, can do or can't do where they're at with it. Parents are often more in tune with their kids' reading ability than even the people in that are teachers at school because t- really they have often as many as 30 kids that they have to be in the know for. And mm-hmm. moms and dads, they read bedtime stories with their kids. They know where their kids are at with that. And, and so they really are the best ones to dive in because they can say, we're just going to start where you're at and go forward. Fantastic. Now, are there some good on, like you've kind of mentioned that, that organization, which we'll put a link in the show notes, but are there some good online groups that listeners could, could check out and maybe get some support and advice from, especially if they're, you know, getting their toes wet, kind of thinking about this might be something they want to do. Well, considering that you and I are talking together on a Down syndrome related podcast, I'm going to specifically point out two online groups related to that group of people. There's a Facebook group called Homeschooling and Down Syndrome. That's mm-hmm. the first group that I went to when I was thinking of homeschooling McKenna. It was the only one that I knew of in existence that had a decent number of people in it. And it was really, really good. There, are you know, such a variety of people there, people who are homeschooling kids in high school or right at the start, people with all sorts of experiences, people who pulled their kids out of school, just just all sorts of things. And so there was like a lot of, I did a lot of snooping first and just mm-hmm. kind of watching what people were saying about various things about, you know, therapies and stuff. And a lot of what I've shared with you, I actually picked up there over time. So it's, it's a really good group. It's a really big group. And if people are wanting something a little smaller and more intimate, and maybe with people that are still more geared towards the earlier years, the DSDN homeschooling group is called Homeschooling Support and Down Syndrome. Mm-hmm. It's it's not nearly as sizable, but it's a very positive, friendly place to go and to also learn more and ask questions. And I found both groups great for asking questions. So people should feel comfortable doing that if they go there. And the DSDN one is one of the subgroups, right? Yes, it's one okay. of the sub subgroups. People would need to join a, a DSDN group if they weren't currently in one in order to to join that group but we've had many many people in the last even few months that have joined that group so it oh, seems wow. to be a very growing thing <laughs> so they need so what christine was saying is to join the dsdn one you need to be in a dsdn birth group and then you can like there's over 50 subgroups there's something for everyone there for the different subgroups literally i i can't think of what else they could add but there's something for everyone there There's even a fitness one, you know, for moms. There's a single one for moms. Like there is literally something for everyone. So, you know, if you're looking for some other online community, not just for homeschooling, but, you know, connect with the DSDN, get into a birth group, and then you can join the 50 plus other subgroups that they have there. You know, there might be something of interest there that you didn't even know that you were interested in. So, yeah. So a great, great resource. Now, 
I kind of missed one of the questions that I did want to ask you about, you know, like homeschooling McKenna. So, you know, I feel like we know our kids best and how they learn and, and stuff. So we can, especially with homeschooling, you can adapt more readily, which obviously you can't do in the public school system. I've seen it firsthand. Like, are you able to give a couple of examples of maybe how you've adapted things for McKenna that maybe you did differently for your other kids? Yeah. Well, to start with, in general, people with Down syndrome tend to be a little bit more visual learners. Mm -hmm. So whenever I've been trying to teach her things, I will look for resources or curriculums or whatever that will utilize that strength to help learn. We are, are still in the early writing, early reading aspect of things. And so I looked into a program called Handwriting Without Tears. I've heard it was of that. actually created by an occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, had some excellent ideas. I've still had to adapt a bit from, from how it was done because it was still more intended for typical learners. Mm -hmm. But I got these wooden pieces that you can use to build the letters. And so as we're learning the letters, she can be taking those, those wooden strips and she can be putting them on a laminated card that has the letter i never did that with my other kids uh i i don't have time to reinvent the wheel so i just chose a program that did a lot of the adapting for me so i have mm -hmm. much less adapting to do for her individual needs but it gives her a chance to show she knows the shape of the letter without having to have the fine motor skills to be making it and doing a great job so that would be one example for her I'm also using all about reading with her. We're going to venture into trying to do the CVC words this mm -hmm. fall. And the tiles are tiny. They're like maybe <laughs> one inch across. Yeah. And so I found a place online where I could print out larger versions of those. So I'm going to make some larger ones, laminate them so they stand to the test of time. And we can start putting together words without her having to, you know, use all her energy on handling these tiny little tiles. So. Mm -hmm. Just some of the variations that I'm doing to to teach with her. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I did buy those little tiles for Ainsley. Didn't work so well. So <laughs> I have seen other kids with Down syndrome use them, and that's why I bought them. But Ainsley's fine motor skills are pretty poor. You know, we're still yes. working on like pen control and, you know, holding a, a writing instrument. It's It's been really challenging yeah. to say the least, you know. Yeah, so. we've adapted by using... Uh, markers instead mm -hmm. of pens or pencils because yes. of the la less left or friction in it. It's just easier to write with. And yeah, there's all the little adaptations you have to do to try and help your child. And those are great tips. And I think I'm assuming you could probably find those on in the online groups, or at least you could ask, I'm sure. And someone could point you in the right direction, right? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. People awesome. are very helpful. Yes, I'm sure. Because I do find in our Down syndrome community, people are very helpful because we all want to see our kids succeed, whether in the public school or private school or being homeschooled or unschooled, you know, just whatever. I just, I do find like we're, it's people often say you're in the club that you thought you never wanted, to, that you never thought you wanted to be a part of, right? <laughs> and it's, a, you know, for the most part, it's a pretty awesome club. So, the <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to add or maybe to encourage people who are considering homeschooling? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to encourage you that if you think it's right for you, you 100% can do it. Your best help in homeschooling is to just trust your gut. It picks up on things and, and, and really is worth trusting just remind you that you know your child best and you love them and want what's best for them which makes you really the best person to, to educate them <laughs> um, and really reach out find a community to support you I've already mentioned a few all online places but you can always reach out and see if you can find places locally and last of all have fun nobody likes learning when it just seems like it's always hard yeah and frustrating and sad and whatever so you know what if, if you need to jump up and down on the trampoline while you learn teach your child how to skip count go for it no one's telling you you have to sit at the table so do what you need to 
have fun and you can do it. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm sure those who are kind of on the fence will really appreciate those words of encouragement. I just want to thank you so much, Christine, for coming on today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom of the homeschooling world. I'm sure people will have learned a lot. I know I did, even though we've chatted lots of times about this. And, you know, I do see more and more people, you know, going this route these days. Thank you so much for coming on today, Christine, and sharing your knowledge and wisdom of the homeschooling world. I'm sure a lot of parents will find it really beneficial. Thank you. You're welcome. Although several times in chatting with Christine, I said, you know, I'm not really cut out to homeschool. You know, the pandemic kind of proved that, but mind you, that wasn't really homeschooling. It was more like crisis schooling. But it, after talking with Christine, it really gave me pause for thought about, you know, why people homeschool and, you know, that it is achievable. You know, I know Christine, she has faith in me that I could do it. And, you know, I believe that I I could do it. I just don't think right now would be a right fit for me. And for other reasons too, it's not really uh, the best, you know, the timing right now just isn't really great. But, you know, with a lot of Ainsley's behavior issues and things going on at school, it really made me think about it more as to why I see people would homeschool their kids. And obviously, Christine gave lots of reasons as to why people choose to homeschool their kids. And many I hadn't hadn't even thought about, like, even just for your own personal schedule, you know, you're not bound by when your children aren't in school, you can take time off when you need to, and things like that. But I also believe it's a really personal choice. And, you know, you want obviously what's best for your child. And I, I do feel obviously a smaller class, you know, at home, I think in a lot of ways is more ideal for a lot of our kids. And, you know, and I think it is very achievable if you're able to do that. If, you know, if that's something you want to consider, you know, uh, here are some of my takeaways. So, you know, as Christine said, what you really need is the passion and desire to want to do it. You know, it doesn't matter what your level of education is. It doesn't affect how your child will score on tests. You just have to have the willingness, the desire to do it. Number two is the first thing you need to do is pat yourself on the back. You have been teaching your child from the moment they were born. And yes, I know that, but I hadn't really thought of it in that context before that we're always teaching our kids. You know, here I'm thinking, I can't teach Ainsley, but yes, I have been teaching Ainsley since the day she was born. And and you are too. And number three, which I loved, is find a mentor. You know, we always need to find people who've gone down the road before us. Just what I am doing on my Down syndrome journey is I'm always looking at the parents who have kids that are older than Ainsley. So, you know, if this is something that interests you, you know, find a mentor, you know, look at your kids strengths and weaknesses. Those are things, you know, what they're good at, you can focus on that and weaknesses, maybe those are things that just need a little bit more work. But a mentor can certainly guide you, you know, introduce you to curriculum, and tips and tricks that worked for them. And number four, which I thought was actually kind of cool, I guess, is unschooling. You know, I've, I've heard this term a lot, but I was never really quite sure what it was. But, you know, unschooling is more of an interest based kind of learning. And it's kind of going with what your child is interested in, you know, what motivates them, you know, you could still be homeschooling, 
but maybe it it looks a little bit more like unschooling because maybe you're not following a, really a specific curriculum. But also that unschooling is basically schooling through life. We're always learning things. And I never really thought of it like this. And I thought it was really interesting because I, especially the last couple of years, I've heard a lot about unschooling and I was never really sure exactly what it meant. But when Christine explained it, it just made so much more sense to me. And, you know, it's good for us to always be learning and, and trying new things. And number five, you know, this is the one thing that you hear about all the time is if you're going to homeschool your kids, they're not going to be socialized, there's going to be the lack of socialization. And as Christine said, there is a lot of research out there that shows this whole lack of socialization stuff is actually a myth. The difference is where is whether your child is socialized by 30 kids in their classroom and the te- their teacher or whether it's in other situations like our kids go to dance class or swim class or they're in guides or brownies or whatever. There are lots of ways for homeschool kids to socialize. I know that when my brother, my younger brother's kids were being uh, homeschooled, they were always involved in all sorts of things with the whole homeschool community. They had a drama class, they had uh, camping trips, they had all sorts of things. They were busy like several days a week. So there was no lack of socialization there. That's for sure. And Number six, you know your child best and you love them and want what's best for them, which makes you really the best person to educate them. You know what they're good at, you know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, you know, you can do this. Yes, you can. If you have the desire, you can do it and, you know, I think it's a wonderful opportunity if you are able to homeschool your kids. And number seven, you know, have fun. Nobody likes learning when it seems like it's always hard and frustrating. You know, it's easy to learn when something's fun, when something's exciting. You know, for me, math was never very exciting. And so I always felt like I never did very well at it. But there are lots of ways that you can make things exciting. Like Christine said, if you have a trampoline, you can bounce on how to, and on it and learn how to skip skip count. You know, so there's lots of creative ways that you can make things fun. And there is a whole online community out there for you, you know, that people can give you ideas and discuss different ways of teaching our kids. You know, I think the world is your oyster out there. There's, like I said, there's lots of online presence there. And we'll put a link to the two groups that Christine mentioned and some of the other resources uh, that she mentioned in the show notes. So you can uh, look for those things like the handwriting without tears and things like that. That's something that I'm definitely going to look up because we've been really working on that and it hasn't been great to be honest so you know so thanks for listening to the t21 mom podcast and i really hope that you enjoyed today's episode if you'd like you can drop me a line and let me know what you thought of today's episode or any other episode at t21 mom podcast at gmail.com uh you can also find me on facebook I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Trisomy21Mama. And, you know, you can also have a little visit to my new updated website, T21Mom.com. You can also leave me a message there. And if you so desire, you could leave a little voicemail and perhaps I can use it on an upcoming episode. And it would also really mean a lot if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify so that we can be a little more searchable for those in the Down syndrome community. And also 
Please let your friends know about the T21 Mom podcast because word of mouth is a powerful thing. So keep on loving on your rocking kiddos and I'll see you next time. Thank you.